webinar on the geopolitical, legal, and economic contexts of the war following Hamas' horrific terror attack on Israel. Hosted by Ariel Ablin, the Israeli Deputy Permanent Representative to the OECD. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm pretty happy about uh, uh, the good attendance that we have today. And I appreciate your intellectual uh, curiosity and uh, uh, openness to this uh, topic. Um, today we have us, with us uh, three very special uh, panelists that I will uh, represent. But first, I want to say a few words uh, about uh, what you see here behind me. Uh, I must say that uh, since the 7th of October, uh, we are in a different mode in Israel and right here at the delegation as well. Uh, and we had a few uh, visits of families of abductees that came to Paris uh, in order to plead for, for the lives of their loved ones for, to, for the international community. Uh, so personally, I took it uh, to my heart uh, and I, I promised to the families of the abductees uh, that I will do whatever is in my power to keep this uh, topic alive. And be, right be, behind me, you can see uh, um, the face of Noah Argamani, who is uh, an abductee from the party in Reim in Israel. She was abducted. I think most of you saw this film. Uh, and uh, with a clear message that you see under it is bring them home now. We expect them to be home back with their families. So after saying that, uh, I want to uh, present my uh, esteemed panelists uh, that um, happily joined me today. So first I would like to introduce uh, Nadav Eyal. Nadav is a uh, uh, award-winning journalist and a, and a best-selling author of the World best best-selling book, uh, The Revolt uh, Against uh, Globalization. Sorry, Nadav, if I'm don't, not accurate about <laughs> the exact words, but it's a very, very interesting book, and I recommend that you go and read it. Uh, and the second panelist is uh, Natasha Hausdorff. Natasha Hausdorff is a British barrister, and she's a specialist on international law, and she will speak uh, with us on the international uh, law aspects. And third, and but not uh, Last is Adrian Filut. Adrian Filut is uh, the chief economic uh, columnist of Calcalist. Calcalist is the most the widespread economic uh, uh, newspaper in Israel. Uh, and he will speak to us about uh, the economic aspects. But first, uh, I want to say a few words about the focus of this webinar. Uh, I decided to focus, uh, try to zoom out from the from this conflict, which is very, very covered in the media. And uh, I want to zoom out because I think when we zoom out, it enables us to see the broader picture, uh, which will be, I think, very interesting to all of us. So the focus will be much, much more zoom out than what we're used to, uh, see, to see in the media. So let's start with Nadav Eyal. Nadav, hello. Uh, just uh, let me unmute you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank uh, you. So let's start with my, my first question. Uh, what are the geopolitical interests of the superpowers in this uh, uh, in the Middle East prior to the 7th of October? And when I say mm -hmm. superpowers, I refer to the U.S., the European Union, Russia, and China uh, in this regard. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you, and I'm, I'm very happy to speak uh, with all of these uh, participants. Um, so, the interests just before uh, October 7th are very clear. The U.S., uh, which I regard as the only uh, superpower, the others are powers indeed, but, uh, but the only real superpower, uh, it was trying to prevent China from entering the foray of the Middle East, was very worried about both the Russian interference and the Chinese uh, entry that we have seen in several meetings and treaties signed uh, between Saudi Arabia uh, and between China. And that the way that China is seeing what we call the Near East as a region that it can incorporate itself to, uh, 
is part of the the entire Chinese strategy of becoming much more apparent in international affairs as a global power. And uh, the, the, the Americans saw an opportunity there, both because of the Saudi interest. Uh, the Saudi interests are very much in terms of defense, military, contracts, and others. And the Israeli interest, which was, as usual, as much normalization as you can get after the Abraham Accords, uh, and the fact that they're trying to prevent, again, the entry of the Chinese. Uh, they saw an opportunity, a window of opportunity to reach a normalization agreement, a historic normalization agreement between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which would have affected other Arab countries and their normalization with Israel. And we're saying normalization, but it's actually peace. You know, these are actual peace treaties, and they would have influenced, of course, the, the entire region. Uh, the negotiations towards this were intense. They were viable. And uh, it was predicted almost on the record by the Biden administration that they could be finalized in a matter of less than a year. We were looking at uh, an MOU months away before October 7th between the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and between the State of Israel, which would have included, by the way, uh, according to the demands by both the American administration and the Saudis, uh, a very significant reference to the right of the Palestinians uh, for national self-determination, for a state, empowering the Palestinian Authority, attributing funds for the building of the Palestinian Authority institutions by the Saudi Arabian Kingdom, and more. And uh, this is uh, the, the situation in which we are at if you were looking from the Western axis. And of course, the EU supported this, although it wasn't directly involved. It's according to the European strategy to the Middle East. Again, it sees the United, the Israel as, as part of the Middle East. It wants Israel to be integrated to, to the Middle East. It wants to see more commercial and trade barriers uh, being lifted. So it all fitted in quite quite nicely uh, in that sense. But on the other hand, what we have seen, and sometimes we disregarded, was the way in which the axis led by Iran, uh, to an extent China, uh, and to a larger extent Russia. China is not really a part of the, this axis, but uh, is considering its position uh, very carefully, as, as uh, Chinese usually do. Um, we, we have seen an increase in its power. The power of Iran has increased tremendously in, in the region. Iran is supportive of uh, uh, several proxies, first of which is, of course, Hezbollah, the most important military and political force in Lebanon, also a terror organization designated by the EU as such and the United States, and of course by Israel, uh, supportive, very supportive of Hamas, that is not a Shia a organization is a, a Islamic a Sunni fundamentalist terrorist organization, but also supported by Iran, Islamic Jihad, also in the Gaza Strip, supported by Iran, the Houthis uh, in Yemen, also supported uh, by Iran. And since the breakdown of the JCPOA uh, deal, uh, led by uh, President Trump and supported, unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, by the Israeli government. Since that breakup, there is no doubt that the Iranians have only garnered power in the Middle East and have not been limited uh, either by the United States or by diplomatic developments such as normalization between Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel. And you also saw that the Russians, very much embroiled in the Ukraine war, we're looking for something to take the eyes of the world off Ukraine, to have the U.S. fight. And this, I know this is, uh, you know, in retrospect and in retrospect, we're all very clever. But it was uh, often said at the time uh, by spectators to the Ukrainian-Russian conflict that the Russians might want to somehow expand, expand uh, the front of the West so that some of the weight and the pressure that they are facing will be lifted. And uh, the Middle East was, was a great place to start because uh, the Russians are holding 
uh, Syria as a sort of a client state. There, they saved the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad during the uh, civil war. Uh, Iran is also supportive, of course, of, the, of that regime. Uh, without Russian support, it's hard to imagine uh, weapons reaching Hezbollah. A lot of the weapons reaching Hezbollah uh, is originating uh, from Russia one way or the other, or from the Iranian um, uh, state. And of course, Russia and Iran started collaborating during the Ukraine war. This collaboration was deemed strategic. Uh, it's not me defining that, but the two sides. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, the use of Iranian weapons in the Ukrainian uh, war, and we're talking about building factories in Iran uh, that will mass produce for Russia and the other way around. So this access was building. And if you look at IDF and the Israeli defense, apparatus assessments, they were saying that the chances for a regional war are higher than ever, and they were continuously warning in the last two years that a regional war with this axis, you have Iran there, you have Hamas, you have Hezbollah, you have the support of Russia, you have some sort of entry of China, that this kind of a regional war is, is something that Israel should consider and should start calculating including, for instance, four letters, four letters sent by the head of the Israeli intelligence, the IDF intelligence, to the prime minister uh, during May to July 2023, saying the enemies of Israel are seeing Israel in a, a historic weakness, and they might try to use this chance and attack it. Um, so you can see here very vividly, I think, the interests of the sides. That's the question you, you've been asking me, Ariel. Uh, and, and you see that the interest of, of uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia is to expand sort of the Western hemisphere and normalization and trade relations and such. And the interest of the other side is basically weakening uh, the United States and weakening the Israeli hegemony, uh, security hegemony in the region. And of course, the Russian interest, which is another front for the West. And I'll just say something to finish this up. So if you look at the Ukrainian war, one of the things that happened, to be frank, is that the West united behind Ukraine, at least at the beginning. We're not seeing this today. And if you look at the US Congress, this idea is dead. But at least in the first year, you saw that the West is uniting because of the war against Vladimir Putin, who's a brutal dictator uh, that occupied part of, of Ukraine. Uh, but if you look at the way that the West is responding to the war in Gaza, again, you have here an aggressor. The aggressor is Hamas. It attacked and attempted ethnic cleansing and uh, genocidal attacks against Israeli citizens. But here the West is not uniting. Uh, the West is uh, dividing itself uh, between, uh, you know, some some parts of the radical left or progressives, other parts uh, that that want to stay out because of uh, Israel being an occupier in the West Bank and other reasons that we can go into. But basically, you don't see the same unity. And this makes Russians, Iranians, Hezbollah and Hamas extremely happy uh, because what they're seeing is a, a, a situation in which the West cannot sort of forge a very clear message uh, if you look you know, at the entire populations. So if you look at the, the UK, for instance, the UK government does, the US government does, but if you look at Spain, it's a different story, right? And if you look at other countries, uh, mainly in Africa and other places, sometimes very much supported by the West, it's a different story altogether. Uh, and this, of course, emboldens Hamas and emboldens Iran and the Houthis that they can try more because the West doesn't know exactly in what side it is uh, in this war. And for me, of course, as an Israeli, although I'm, I'm a journalist, but uh, I'm first and foremost an Israeli, it's very frustrating. Uh, because can, it's very... I, sorry, sorry. Nada, to interrupt you, but if I can, if you can elaborate a bit more about the Iranian chess game in the Middle East. You know, the word in, in chess in Hebrew comes from Farsi. Yes, so of course. what is the chess game that Iran is playing in the region? So uh, my family 
uh, my mother and uh, grandparents and uh, aunts and uncles used to live many years in, in Iran before the revolution. And one of the things that uh, sometimes is said in Iran is that in order to be a player in the Middle East, uh, there are three things, what you think, what you do, and what you say. And it's essential that the three things would not be just one, won't be united. Um, so what the Iranians are saying is that they have, of course, no no fight with anyone. They they, they just, you know they don't understand. When I speak with Iranians, sometimes they don't understand what's what's the problem with Israel. Why, why are you seeing us as a as a, a, an enemy? <laughs> and so what they're saying is that they, you know all they want to do is to be left alone and to um, uh, be the the kind of uh, oil producing country that they are. Uh, and of course, what they do is completely contrary to that. Uh, Iran is. And this is a fact, uh, really the, very much supportive of, of terror, the, the number one uh, state that supports terror in the world. Uh, it does that just very formally uh, with organizations that are aimed at destroying Israel and uh, having a genocide with all its citizens. By the way, probably not only Jews, but also uh, Arab Israelis that we have seen on October 7th. And and what what they think is that at the end uh, the U.S. is withdrawing from the region. So this is the basic assessment of the Iranians. It needs to be understood that the the EU cannot really have a real strategy to the Middle East because some of them would buy Iranian oil, some of them won't, some of them will want to uh, export to Iran, some of them won't. So the EU is not a real player, but the US is a real player, and the US doesn't have the resolve to stay the course in the Middle East. This is the basic assessment of Iran, and this is the reason that the Iranians feel much more secure in installing their uh, terror organizations around the region with their final aim being the hegemon of the entire Muslim world in the Near East, uh, surpassing surpassing uh, Saudi Arabia, surpassing Egypt, and of course, in the way they need to destroy the hegemony, the military hegemony of Israel, they say destroy it, but uh, more likely they're looking at a, a very weakened country that doesn't have the support of the West or uh, of the United States, uh, that its citizens are having, you know, are having a daily hellish hell of a life, uh, you know, being manufactured by various terror activities with its elite leaving it. And this is their view of, of the Middle East, of course, coupled with them being a theocracy, and wanting to enshrine a fundamentalist vision on the entire region. Th this is the this is how Iran sees it. So if I switch, you mentioned before Saudi Arabia and Egypt. If I switch from the Shi Shiite world to the Sunni world, the Arab, mm -hmm. uh, what is called more moderate mm -hmm. Muslim world, uh, if you can just speak a, a little bit about the Abraham Accords, what were the significance of the Abraham Accords, and and what is the potential for a, for an accord between Israel and Saudi Arabia? So, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll begin with the last uh, point that you made. Uh, Saudi Arabia has not redrawed its intention to have normalization with Israel, even after October 7th and the Israeli response, and even after condemning uh, the Israeli response and the killing of innocent uh, people, according to Saudi Arabia, in the Gaza Strip. So the Saudis are still very much committed, that's what they're saying to Washington, to having agreements and normalization with Israel, and it's one of the achievements of the process and of the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords were a historic breakthrough because they managed to disconnect between the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and between the Arab world and, and countries around the Arab world. And this was a first. This was a first. It never happened before in that sense. And it's very meaningful uh, that, that it did. But uh, we have seen that you know, we have seen October 7th, and one of the arguments that indeed can be made is that it's not it's not viable and it's not sustainable. You cannot really just uh, disconnect that link with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And this was, to an extent, what Hamas tried to achieve. They tried to say, oh, you can't forget the Palestinian cause. You think you can forget it, but we have our weapons, we have our resolve, 
and we're willing to kill as many people as, as we can in order to make sure you don't forget about us. Having said that, the Abraham Accords managed to, to uh, pave the way for normalization around the Middle East, even if the entirety of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict cannot be solved. So this concept is still there. And how do I know it's still there? Because the United Emirates can condemn Israel for, for its aerial attacks in the Gaza Strip, but it didn't disconnect uh, its relations with Israel. It didn't uh, decide that these agreements are void. It's simply not where we are at right now, right? And the same is true for Bahrain and other countries. And I, I, I would just add that this entire kind of... Uh, um, divide of Shia and Sunnah as to the Middle East that sometimes is being done, I think it's much, much uh, too um, crude, uh, to say the least. So what we are really seeing in the Middle East are moderates versus, versus extremists. I can think about Shia that are uh, supportive of relations with Israel. And I just mentioned Bahrain. It's not a good example. It's, it's a very complex example, and we can go into it. Uh, but and I can think about Sunnis that are very uh, moderate, and of course Hamas that is very extreme and fundamentalist, and it's it's very much Sunnah. So the divide is really between moderates versus uh, Iran or pro-Russia kind of uh, folk and countries and groups that are supported by, and these groups have been allowed allowed by the international community to grow. And this is sort of my last point. Uh, to that matter, and you're, you're going to have um, uh, the fabulous Natasha Hauser to, to say much more about that. But the international community has not been fighting Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran and support of terror as it should have. It, it was sort of seeing them as, yeah, the terror groups, but they're against Israel. So, you know, it might be fine or it might be understood to an extent. It's not the same terrorists. Some some would say it's resistance groups. You know, the UN Charter protects the rights to to um, uh, to try and uh, uh, fight uh, as, as part of decolonization. So maybe they, they'll apply to that. They had uh, their own politics within these countries, and now it came with a vengeance, and we are all paying the price. Not only in Israel, not only. So of course, in Israel, we pay the price in October seventh. Uh, but these organizations that Hamas had in Western countries and the way it was accepted is that you can raise money there. And, and the way that countries like Qatar have been supportive on the record, on the record, with organizations that their stated aim is basically to kill every man, woman, child in my country without paying any price, without having any sort of uh, moral kind of considerations there with without judicial action, both private and public. It's just amazing. And, and because of this immunity that was given to these organizations and to their sponsor states, we are at where we are today, not seeing normalization with Saudi Arabia, which, which we could have already seen a peace agreements, historic peace agreements, not having the Palestinian Authority strengthened and the possibility for a Palestinian national self-determination enshrined as part of the Abraham Accords, but instead having to face the possibility of a regional war and having dozens of thousands of people dead, all in the responsibility of Hamas and those who have sent them. And I think that many in the West are waking up to this. We're seeing the action made in Germany, to some degree in the UK, of course. We're seeing, of course, the Americans. But there's so much to do there. They cannot enjoy a moral clout of sorts by supporting terror organizations that are Palestinians. You don't get that. You don't get this kind of ticket, get out of jail card because they are Palestinians. So calling for genocide is fine and, and, and preparing for genocide is fine. And Israel, uh, as far as I can see, is not going to withdraw from this.
this is just the beginning. It might take years, uh, but it's not going to be, you know, uh, solved on these issues, not on its border, and to an extent, not internationally. And now it's it's sort of a, a test for the West. Okay, I have uh, the final and the hardest questions for you, but I will join them together. Uh, so we, you mapped several actors, superpowers, regional powers. What do you think was the role, if there was any, in the 7th of October attacks? Of these powers? You said Iran, you mentioned Russia. So uh, if you, are you asking if Iran or Russia knew of these attacks beforehand? Maybe. Okay. We know that there was um, um, an Iranian involvement in um, equipping Hamas, in funding Hamas, in supporting of their stated goals. We know that there is some sort of a, a Russian involvement. We know that the Russians are conducting influence operations within Israel as we speak now. We know this for a fact. Um, we know, of course, that Hamas traveled to Moscow after the attack. So after the attack, the Kremlin accepts a delegation of Hamas officials after they murder, you know, hundreds of Israelis. Uh, they have this kind of uh, really a trial in genocide on our borders. Uh, a pilot in ethnic cleansing on mass scale. Uh, so we know that. If you're asking if there were actual military guides on the ground during the attack, I don't have this kind of intelligence. I don't think that it's true. But I think we will know more about the Russian involvement with Hamas towards the war we will know more in the coming weeks and months ahead. And there is no doubt that senior officials here in Israel are saying that there was a Russian involvement and they would not uh, give us specific details. I can say that it's not about having military uh, personnel on the ground during October 7th. So. We don't have this kind of intelligence as to as far as Russia is concerned. So last question, but let's keep it uh, short in the sake of Natasha. Um, so what's next? What do you think are the potential consequences of the 7th of October terror attacks for the region and beyond going so forward? The, OK, so that's a big question. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, but, uh, that's, that's by, by points. The region and beyond. Uh, so so um, we we will see uh, Israel embroiled in, I don't want to say a perpetual war in the South, but it's going to be a long war. It's going to be a long war. It's going to take time until we have a new order in the Gaza Strip. All of those who are seeking some kind of a quick solution, a quick fix for the Gaza Strip, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because you have Hamas there. As, as long as you have Hamas, the main, by the way, the main contributor of Hamas are taxes. It just collects taxes. Okay, it's more than Iran. It's more than Qatar. And as long as you have population and you have people with guns, and they are feeding, uh, you know, um, the, the Hamas is feeding off its control there. So you'll see a long war, and uh, and now it's up to Israel and the United States and the moderate Arab states to see if they can have an access of their own, if they have a union of sorts of the moderates in the region. And it's a test. It's a test for Israel, too. Uh, if and I'm a journalist, I'm an independent journalist. My criticism is well known. If the Israeli government would not see that it needs to have both concessions and understandings with moderates in the region, uh, we will have huge problems in maintaining this kind of line of moderates during the next couple of years. So. This is the real thing that we need to have in order to have a future for the Middle East that will not be dictated by Tehran and Moscow. And if it will be dictated by them, it will look exactly like Tehran and Moscow, which are a disaster for the people, a disaster for their economy, and a disaster for the world. Thank you, Nadav Thank you very much. It was very interesting.
Thank you. And now let me switch to Natasha Hausdorf. Hello, Natasha. Good to be with you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so let's let's just uh, move aside for a while to the issue of international law. Uh, so I think the the biggest terror attack in history, by the way, uh, the attack of the 7th October is the second largest in history on a Western country. And per capita, it is by far the largest terror attack. And I think we're writing the textbooks on, on effects of terror attacks as, as, we, as we go along. Um, but let's go back to 9-11, how it changed the world of international law. So how, how, how actually did it change after 9-11 and the global war on terror? So there are, in fact, big debates uh, about how uh, the so-called war on terror impacted international law, in particular the law of armed conflict, um, and arguments also ensue over, uh, you know, the supposed accelerated or instantaneous formation of customary international law. Um, but it's clear, and I think you know, even commentators that disagree on the effects um, of those discussions and developments would agree that. What international law of armed conflict had previously focused on uh, and where it had developed from initially uh, in the 1860s and, and the initial uh, treaties that formed the very basis of the law of armed conflict, uh, we often refer to them as um, the, the beginnings of Geneva law and, and Hague law, uh, that initial birth of regulating war and providing a legal framework was rooted in a concept of two relatively equal armies fighting each other. Uh, and those were armies that were expected to be law abiding in their approaches uh, to combating the enemy. Uh, what 9-11 uh, brought with it was an understanding that law based on a, a framework uh, that had developed in that context uh, would not achieve uh, the desired outcomes of uh, a proper regulatory uh, format and framework for the new kind of warfare that was being mooted. Uh, and so in, in the context of uh, the war on terror, uh, there has been uh, arguably a shift in how international law of armed conflict is applied vis-a-vis uh, -vis non state actors and in the context of asymmetrical armed conflict um but i i should stress that in the context of what we're seeing in israel's war against hamas specifically uh, in the wake of the 7th of october is perhaps less affected by those big debates because it ultimately comes down to, and this applies whether one looks at the conflict through a, 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 an international armed conflict prism or a non-international armed conflict prism, the basic rules of international law uh, applicable to armed conflict uh, are uh, equally applied, equally applicable. And in very many cases, they are considered to be an aspect of customary international law. Now, I, I don't know how many lawyers um, we might have on, on the line with us, but um, it's important perhaps as a, a preliminary just to identify the sources of international law. Uh, because unlike law in a domestic context, uh, which in the UK, for instance, uh, we get from statute, from legislation, and also from judge-made law under the common law tradition, in an international context, um, the key sources of international law uh, are primarily treaty based. So these are agreements that states enter into, uh, law that they sign themselves up to and bind themselves to, uh, and this concept of custom, uh, which I mentioned right at the outset of, of this introduction. Now, custom is a, is a very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, it develops in the general sense over a course of time. Uh, and it is based on states' behavior. If states behave in a particular way, believing themselves to be legally bound uh, to perform that sort of conduct, ultimately, at uh, the crystallization of that custom, they will uh, come under a legal obligation uh, to continue that conduct. Uh, and so, 
just going back to the very beginning of of your question and and the development of international law after 9/11 the arguments for the the crystallization of custom instantaneously uh, were essentially a response to uh, state actors and law abiding state actors critically finding themselves in a position where they were having to develop new law to deal with with new concepts and and new challenges and so that idea of of instantaneous custom came into play but critically and this dovetails i think um very very neatly with with what nadav has um been discussing what we're seeing in terms of the international discourse over the application of international law to israel's conduct over the last few months uh, and and this um ties in with of course criticism that israel comes under vis-a-vis international law more generally uh, and and I, we can certainly come on to discussing uh, aspects of those um references to that were also part of of nadab's remarks and uh, i would suggest that many of the criticisms that are leveled against israel uh using supposed legal terminology are in fact political criticisms yeah, but before, um, before sorry okay. natasha before we get to that uh i want to still uh elaborate a bit on international law okay because as you yeah, said I'm after gonna... the, after 911 in change and I, if yeah. you can just delve a little bit more about asymmetrical warfare and how do countries dealt with before with uh, actors that do not abide by international law like hamas Sure. Um just to to finish that thought because I think it's critical when we're talking about you know what international law actually says um I just want to highlight a phenomenon that I think it it ties in with what Nadav was was uh alluding to uh which is um legal phrases being deployed in a political context uh, and often and and this this unfortunately uh has caught on um in a context in which i i think the general literacy on international law is is perhaps not as high as it should be and so legal sounding phrases are deployed in political context especially in the context of international discussions and and diplomacy uh vis-a-vis it seems the Jewish state but uh it's important to recognize that they are often misrepresentations of international law even abuses of international law and we can certainly come on to some of, of those uh examples in due course but so far as um asymmetric uh warfare is is concerned um i th- i think it's it's trite to say that even though a law abiding army is contending with uh an entity like hamas that uh, not only uh, shows disregard for the laws of armed conflict but actually very cynically adapts its practices in order to exploit israel's compliance with the laws of armed conflict even in such a situation i don't think there are many uh, international lawyers or military experts that would argue uh, that a defending country is simply let off the hook as far as international law is concerned um you know e- even uh, the, the americans in the context of of the war on terror di- didn't uh, advance uh, a thesis along those lines uh, and um in dealing with hamas israel has to uh navigate a, a, a in many respects an impossible challenge in that it holds itself certainly to the standards of international humanitarian law in many respects uh, arguably above those standards and in fact uh, John Kirby's uh, remarks earlier today indicating that Israel takes uh, more measures than even the United States would in similar circumstances to protect uh civilians in the context of uh an armed conflict situation um that Israel in fact goes above the requirements of the laws of armed conflict when it is conducting uh asymmetric uh warfare and grappling with uh, an uh, entity and it is not just Hamas of course uh Israel is under attack uh and has been uh since its withdrawal from the Gaza strip also by Palestinian Islamic Jihad and in the context of the 7th of October attacks there were uh, also members of the PFLP the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine uh, members of Fatah um, uh, affiliates of the PLO the so-called moderates in this equation uh, so many many different factions uh, but what they uh, perhaps share in common is uh 
their disregard of the laws of armed conflict, uh, their disregard of the requirement, for example, to wear uniforms, not to target civilians, um, and the fact that they use civilians as human shields. Uh, all of that is, of course, not in compliance with the laws of armed conflict. And yet, uh, as a law-abiding military, uh, Israel's approach is to keep uh, to its previous record, it seems, by all accounts, of upholding uh, standards which exceed the laws of armed conflict, as I say, even in that asymmetric context. Okay, so th there's a, there's a uh, feeling uh, which is co very common in Israel, that Israel is held to a higher standard of conflict than other Western countries in the war on terror. Why do you think is that the case? Um, there are, I, I, there are perhaps many possible reasons, and uh, I imagine many of them go into the realms of psychology, uh, which I, I, I shan't um, venture into myself. But it, it does strike me that this concept of lawfare is is pretty critical here. And I'm reminded of uh, an op-ed by Mahmoud Abbas, uh, still president of the Palestinian Authority, entering now, I think, his 18th year of, of, of his original four-year term. Uh, but all the way back in 2011, uh, Abbas wrote an op-ed in the New York Times where he called for the internationalization of the conflict as a legal, not just a political matter. And that was um, essentially Abbas's declaration of lawfare. And it was uh, to do with the use of, of legal means to target Israel. Uh, he was advocating cases to be brought in the ICC, the International Criminal Court, in the International Court of Justice, um, in the UN Human Rights Council, uh, so in international uh, legal fora. Um, and what uh, we saw emanating uh, out of that, but also over the last few decades, uh, is a campaign of lawfare waged across uh, international institutions by what seems to be armies of NGOs uh, promoting uh, a misconception of international law. And that seems to be behind the application of these double standards. Um, and I would say it's also worse than double standards. It's an inversion and an abuse of international law uh, when it comes to Israel. And it um, comprises misrepresentations both of the facts and of the law applicable. And I am bound to say that um, it, it seems even, I mean, I mentioned John Kirby earlier in his remarks today, uh, indicating um, how Israel goes above and beyond uh, what uh, he expects the United States would um, in similar circumstances. But of course, I, I also remember that at the very outset uh, of this uh, campaign against Hamas, this military campaign, he, uh, as a former military man himself, indicated that he would expect in an operation like this to see zero casualties. I mean, coming from a military man, uh, that is utterly absurd. It's important to stress that the law of armed conflict uh, is based on the very unfortunate recognition of the reality that in armed conflict, civilians do die. That is an inevitability. The laws of armed conflict developed in part to seek to minimize civilian and collateral damage. Um, to, to the utmost. And in terms of the framework of international law that we're dealing with, the principle of precaution, which generally informs the application of, of international law is, is critical here. And we can certainly go on to some examples of, of how Israel um, puts the principle of precaution in, into practice in its efforts to minimize civilian casualties. But to suggest that in armed conflict, or in particular in this version of, of urban warfare against an enemy that seeks to drive up the civilian casualty count as much as possible. Um, you know, Hamas make no, um, uh, certainly don't hide their intention to create as many so-called martyrs as possible, uh, nor uh, have they hidden from their own civilian population their intention uh, to continue to use them as human shields. There are reports that Hamas has been shooting civilians who have sought to comply and to follow Israel's advice uh, in the first month of this war to evacuate to the south of Gaza, uh, that they were being uh, shot and, and threatened uh, if they were to evacuate and follow 
those recommendations. And, and equally, we saw that the bombing of the civilian convoy very early on, of course, Israel was being blamed for that and until um, you know, the Americans also uh, came out and, and confirmed that, that Hamas was responsible for, for what seemed to be a, a roadside explosion um, in, in, in the vicinity of that civilian evacuating convoy. Um, so, you know, in that particular context, when we're thinking about um, certainly the, the the measures that Israel takes um, vis-a-vis uh, the um, uh, protection it seeks to afford the the civilian community, and we look at the international commentary and the media coverage, uh, the double standards are stark, but. It's informed, uh, I, I'm afraid, at every step of the way by an awful lot of misinformation about what international law says. And bearing in mind uh, John Kirby's remark, I think if we if we compare casualty figures and we look at um, what the data that the UN has put out says uh, about um I believe it was in the context specifically of urban armed conflict, but the global average that the UN has put out uh, is a very disturbing nine civilian casualties to every one combatant. Um, that ratio uh, is incomparable with uh, Israel's track record in previous conflicts in Gaza. Um, perhaps as a, as a comparison, it's also worth referring to the United States statistics vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, those statistics uh, look at to be about three to one to five to one uh, each civilians to combatants. So still multiple times as many civilians killed in those armed conflicts uh, than combatants. Um, the last operation that Israel conducted earlier this year in the Gaza Strip uh, against Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, the Jerusalem Post uh, analysis of, of the civilian to combatant ratio in that context of that armed conflict was 0 0.6 to one. I mean, that seems to me to be unparalleled in the history of armed conflicts. Now, of course, that was a very different context, a very different scenario to the one that we are seeing played out currently. Uh, Israel's aims uh, in this context are very much more significant, um, ending Hamas's control over the Gaza Strip, removing the threat that Hamas poses uh, now that it has built itself a, a terror infrastructure from which to target Israeli civilians in the south and rescuing the hostages. But what the 0 0.6 to 1 ratio tells us is an awful lot about the way Israel conducts armed conflict and its intention. And uh, as any lawyers on, on the call will know, when it comes to the law of armed conflict, this is not an effects-based analysis. It is based on the intention of the parties. And that is why when we come on to concepts like proportionality, we're not looking at a, a comparison of casualty figures here on any account. I mean, that, that and, and it's been oft repeated by international media, it's, it's flatly wrong. Uh, it's um, legally illiterate. And it also, uh, unfortunately, seems to encourage uh, appalling Hamas tactics of the use of human shields and in driving up civilian casualties as much as possible. Because what one then sees uh, on the basis of a comparison of casualty figures is immediate pressure on Israel to stop its legitimate and lawful uh, targeting of Hamas terror infrastructure. Uh, but importantly, the, the real uh, principle of proportionality in armed conflict uh, is all about a military commander assessing the military advantage advantage which is anticipated by a strike against the likely civilian and collateral damage. Uh, and that is based on the information available at the time that a decision on a military strike is taken. And it's critical to understand that it is based on intention uh, and it is based on the measures that Israel takes uh, to weigh up it strikes on the basis of the information it has, not on the effect. And I would just also add that the real problem with seeking to make an assessment, an effects-based assessment in particular, in the context of uh, the war that we're currently seeing played out, where the information that is being put out, especially on casualty figures, is coming out of the Hamas-controlled uh, Palestinian Ministry of Health, um, 
These are figures, of course, that don't make any distinction between civilians and combatants. Uh, and they also critically do not tell us uh, anything about how these individuals who, who are reported to have died. We, we, we do. There is certainly a lot of criticism uh, on the numbers alone, but uh, there's also no information about how these individuals died. And when we know uh, for a fact that Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas missiles that are fired out of the Gaza Strip onto Israeli civilian communities frequently, in fact, fall short in the Gaza Strip and kill Palestinian civilians, then um, that, that is an, another aspect that needs to be taken uh, very seriously. Uh, the fact that this is not being discussed, uh, so far as I can see, uh, in international media coverage of this is another really strong indicator that, as I said, in terms of the facts and the law, there are enormous represent misrepresentations here that, in fact, go way beyond uh, simple double standards. Well, I, I can say from my personal experience, I don't know a single person in Israel rejoices to see civilians kid, killed on the other side. But still, um, there are claims by uh, pro-Palestinian propaganda of a genocide committed by Israel. What is the legal reality? Um, well, I think it's important perhaps to start with the definition of genocide, uh, which um, I, I have in front of me from Article 2 of, of the Genocide Convention. Uh, again, I mean, it ties in again, I should say, to this issue of intention that I was just speaking about. Uh, but it states genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethic, uh, uh, ethnical, racial or religious group. Uh, and the acts that it refers to include uh, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily harm, uh, deliberately inflicting uh, conditions that are seeking to bring about its physical destruction. Um, I can certainly say uh, that on the basis of uh, a close study of Israel's conduct in previous armed conflict in the Gaza Strip, uh, this is tantamount, this allegation is tantamount to a modern blood libel. Um, it has no basis in uh, the facts or the law, uh, and it uh, is a complete inversion of the measures that Israel is taking to, in fact, protect uh, Palestinian civilian life as well as Israeli civilian life. But where the allegation of genocide uh, is important and does have currency is in what we saw on the 7th of October. I mentioned that, it, of course, it was not just Hamas, but other Palestinian terrorist organizations. Um, but it is critical to understand. And, and ordinary Palestinian civilians joining and, in. And, and by all accounts, of course, there were also or, or, uh, ordinary Palestinians. The, the, the difficulty with calling them uh, civilians is that in the context of the law of armed conflict, to the extent that they were taking a direct part in hostilities, that they would potentially lose that status. But yes, certainly reports um, of civilians who uh, joined in the massacre, the slaughter, the atrocities on the 7th of October, and also continuing reports that, that some uh, 60 hostages uh, are understood to be held uh, by civilians rather than, uh, than terror groups. But what we saw on the 7th of October, the atrocities that were committed, uh, committed with an intention which has been articulated by the Hamas leadership repeatedly, which is, uh, you know, depending on, on how one paraphrases it, to wipe Israel off the map or to, to kill every Jew possible. It's plain that although there were uh, Israeli Arabs uh, and foreign workers caught up in those atrocities, the intention was to kill the Jews. And the acts that were committed, and there is also increasing debate as to uh, the, the use of, of rape uh, as, a, as a weapon of genocide also, uh, and uh, sexual offences that were committed. Um, so on that basis, uh, the true application of, a, of the definition of, of genocide uh, does apply to the situation that we are witnessing, but uh, in the inverse fashion. Uh, and the reason it's it's particularly important, I think, to recognize um, the gravity of this, uh, again, ties in with elements of, of what Nadav has already spoken to. And this is the role that the international community have played and continue to play. Because 3,000 terrorists don't uh, cross the border one morning, uh, wake up and, and spontaneously decide that it's a good day to slaughter Jews. The atrocities that we saw on the 7th of October and the continuing 
uh, war crimes of the missiles that rain down uh, on Israeli civilian uh, communities uh, that are for the most part uh, stopped by Iron Dome, uh, but not all of them, uh, of course, uh, have been successfully intercepted. But uh, the uh, intention behind those attacks and, and the intention that was seen out uh, on the 7th of October uh, has been the result of 30 years of brainwashing. We have seen generation, uh, now plural, of uh, Palestinian civilians being indoctrinated, uh, in, including in UNRWA UN-run schools, uh, to understand that the highest calling in life uh, is this uh, so-called martyrdom and to slaughter Jews. And this exulting of martyrdom um, is certainly not something that has been uh, hidden. It has been the subject of numerous reports, uh, reports uh, on textbooks by Impact SE, uh, reports also by NGO Monitor in terms of the funding that the international community has provided for these initiatives. Uh, and uh, UN Watch uh, have also put out uh, numerous uh, reports and information uh, on this phenomenon, together with, of course, the incentivization of terror in the pay for slay policy. And it's important to recognize that uh, terrorists are paid salaries uh, by the Palestinian Authority, again, the so-called moderates in this equation, not uh, based on what uh, affiliation they have. It doesn't matter what banner they coalesce under. They are paid on the basis of how successful their atrocities have been, how many Jews they have succeeded in killing, essentially. And it's important to recognize that the, uh, the leaders of the forces of Hamas uh, that uh, planned and conducted these attacks, including Ali Qadi, who, who was uh, released in the 2011 Gilad Shalit deal, um, who planned this attack, it seems, for a period of two years. He was being paid a monthly salary still by the Palestinian Authority uh, for uh, his past crimes. And until the international community uh, internalizes this, understands what has led to this, uh, recognizes that this is not about uh, territory. Uh, this is not about uh, this allegation of occupation. This is an ex existential war that Israel is fighting. Uh, and uh, the Palestinian civilians who have been subject to uh, what I will call child abuse, because this indoctrination begins at kindergarten uh, and indoctrination for uh, so such a long time. We've seen the effects of this also in terms of recent polling in the West Bank, uh, where by all accounts, 70 to 80 percent uh, of the population there um, support what happened on the 7th of October and support Hamas. Um, this is also something that needs to be taken into account because of, I was just about to bring it back to international law and talk about international legal obligations. Uh, in particular, one issue I meant to mention just at the outset of this, because it came in the wake of uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks, is UN Security Council Resolution 1373, which, um, unlike the vast majority of UN resolutions, is in fact legally binding because it was passed under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. And that requires the international community uh, to combat terrorism terrorism, but also to cease uh, and work against the funding of terrorism, be that direct or indirect funding. And these are obligations that the international community must now live up to. Well, last and final question I have to devote to the abductees. You know, uh, we see uh, people, civilians, children, women, men, elderly held in Gaza in atrocious conditions without the International Committee, the Committee of the Red Cross even visiting them. So how does the international community deal with an actor such as Hamas that does not abide by international humanitarian law? Before that, I think we need to get on to how we deal with the ICRC. Um, how an organization like that can have any confidence in the international community when we have reports from terror, from, from the families of abductees, uh, that they have been, uh, lied to, uh, been told that the ICRC doesn't have a presence in Gaza, uh, that they have been refused, uh, basic, uh, basic things like taking in medication, attempting, uh, to accepting medication from the families of the hostages uh, and committing to an even attempt 
to take that medication through or uh, to provide that medication to those hostages that were, le- were released a couple of weeks ago uh, so that they might have uh, life-saving medication as soon as, as possible uh, when they were transferred to the custody of the Red Cross from Hamas. Uh, so I think the first thing that we need to give serious consideration to is whether the International Committee of the Red Cross is in fact fit for purpose, uh, because despite its mission statement, uh, despite um, its uh, maintaining that it is a neutral organisation, uh, its approach vis-a-vis Jewish hostages in this context, has been absolutely reprehensible. And again, international pressure needs to be brought to bear because it has failed abjectly to live up to its responsibilities. So that's so far as the Red Cross is concerned. And when we come to look at you know, Hamas, um, I mentioned, of course, that uh, not only does Hamas flout uh, the rules of of armed conflict, but it cynically abuses them uh, and seeks to uh, use its abuse of uh, law to its own advantage. It seeks to present itself as as immune uh, from uh, lawful attacks against it, uh, lawful strikes by Israel, uh, by uh, hiding behind civilians as human shields. And unfortunately, we can see in the international discourse that that it is in in some quarters been successful in that, um, because as we hear these calls for a ceasefire that would leave uh, Hamas in place to continue uh, its pledge of repeating the 7th of October again and again and again. I mean, that has essentially been achieved by its abuse of international law, by its use of civilians as human shields. Uh, But it is important that the international community can and should be doing more vis-a-vis Hamas. We heard earlier about the involvement of Qatar here. Qatar clearly has leverage over Hamas. And the international community uh, could certainly be doing more to uh, exert leverage over Qatar uh, and and there through leverage over Hamas. Uh, There is an international game certainly being played. Uh, I would argue that it involves serious breaches of international law in terms of the funding uh, that and the support that Qatar has provided to Hamas leadership uh, and the funding, of course, for the terror infrastructure uh, in the Gaza Strip itself. So um, there is more that, that can be done. There is more that countries are legally obliged to do. Uh, and it is extremely disappointing uh, that those obligations are not being followed through. I think the main takeaway here uh, is that uh, the reason international law is being flouted uh, vis-a-vis Hamas, vis-a-vis Hezbollah uh, and uh, other Iranian proxies in their activities against Israel is because the West don't feel that it's their problem. But if the last two months have told us anything, uh, they must have disabused Western actors uh, of this notion. Uh, And the West is next is, I think, one of the main takeaways Uh, Israel has for so long been a bulwark uh, against uh, Islamist fundamentalist terrorism uh, that attacks Western uh, democratic values uh, and the uh, importance of supporting Israel in that battle now uh, is uh, critical, of course, not just for Israeli interests, but for all of those in the West that are threatened by similar terrorism. Well, thank you very much, Natasha Hausdorf. It was very uh, interesting and it gives a lot of uh, fruit for thought. And now we will switch to Adrian Filut for the geoeconomic aspects of what we've seen. So, hi, Adrian. Ah, sorry, I will let you. Adrian is joining us from Sao Paulo, right? Yeah. Okay. So, first, Adrian. Uh, we talked about the geopolitical side, but from the economic side, what could be the economic motivations behind the 7th of October attack for the Russian-Iranian axis? And how are they connected to the peace agreement uh, uh, that uh, was they were, Israel uh, and the international community was working on regarding uh, Saudi Arabia? As the previous panelists mentioned, I think that it, there is a clear connection between uh, the 7th of October attack and the historic agreement with Saudi Arabia, at least there must be a meeting of interest between Hamas and Iran in terms of this attack. I don't know 
details. I'm an, uh, an economic journalist, but there is rather clear that uh, Jerusalem and Riyadh have been steadily inching closer to normalized uh, relations uh, that are called peace, normalizing, you know, it's a, it's a code name. Uh, and uh, I think the main objective or, of Hamas and Iran as well uh, was fulfilled that the, the, those talks were interrupted after Hamas launches uh, the brutal terror attack on Israel uh, um, in October. Even uh, President Biden said that, guess what, he was quoted saying, guess what, the Saudis want to recognize Israel. And I think uh, this was a tremendous um, uh, event in historical terms <clears throat> that will change uh, dramatically the geopolitics and geoeconomics of um, of the Middle East in 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 this sense. Um, uh, okay. I want to I, I want to quote also uh, uh, Neil Ferguson that two weeks ago he made uh, the historian Neil Ferguson to say I think we should also understand the crisis in Israel in terms of what we call, and I am sure that we will delve into that uh, later, what he calls the Cold War II, because Iran now works in a cahoots with Russia, while Iran detected, as Russia did, a, a sort of weakness uh, in Biden administration. Um, and it was very clear that Iran was involved, particularly given that the Palestinian Israel, Islamic Jihad, and of course Hamas, is a wholly, almost wholly owned subsidiary of the Iranian uh, Revolution War. Uh, I think if, another, yeah, please. If, if I may, um, if you can elaborate on, on the geoeconomics of what we're seeing now, uh, well, you spoke about the the Cold War too, but let's talk about let's speak about the economic Cold War between the superpowers. You know, the U.S., EU, China, and Russia. Yeah. And how do you see this connected to what we're seeing in the region? First, I want to uh, uh, go back to the definition of geoeconomics. It's the use of economic tools to advance geopolitical objectives or the interplay of international economics, geopolitics, and, and, and strategy. Uh, and I think that uh, as almost every single report, economic report, course of the OECD or the IMF, um, we are witnessing a uh, Cold War II in terms of geoeconomic fragmentation. Uh, and I mean uh, with geoeconomic fragmentation, any policy-driven reversal of integration, including reversals guided by strategic consideration, such as national security. And of course, it encompasses trade, fiscal, financial uh, and technological measures, such as tariff, export restrictions, subsidiary and restrictions uh, of payments. And we, when we speak about Cold War II, just we must back to basics and remind what was Cold War I when two nuclear armed superpowers complete in terms, compete in terms of ideology, technology, military cap ca uh, capability while uh, they compete at the end of the day geopolitically. Um, World War II, it's a new regime uh, of international order in which basically China had taken the place of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> My conclusion is that the Cold War II that we are witnessing right now is a state of peace that is no peace. The Middle East as it was in Cold War One, in general, and Israel in particular, are crucial are a crucial part of this new Cold War, um, as they were in the first one, as I mentioned. And I think the Hamas attack is an integral part of this uh, Cold War Two. And I think this is extremely important to underscore uh, this point. Um, <clears throat> when uh, we try to figure it out, how this World, Cold War II look like on the ground, um, we uh, can mention as Gopinath, Gita Gopinath from the IMF mentioned uh, a couple of days ago, 
uh, that, for example, the U.S. called this French shoring. We have the inshoring. We have the, the risking. We have another terminology. China uh, uh, like to speak about self-reliance. But uh, basically, we're talking about uh, uh, um, national security concerns are shaping economic policy uh, worldwide. The problem, and basically the danger, is that those plates will drift further apart, uh, fragmenting the global economy into distinct economic blocks with different ideologies, political system, technology standard, and so on. Um, and this uh, concept is connected as well to what we call economic nationalism, uh, which is a practice to create and protect national economies in the context of world markets. I don't think that economic nationalism is necessarily bad, but I do think that national uh, nationalism is negative when it becomes the rule and not the exception. Because we have to, again, back to basics. Uh, we remember uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo when they say, when they wrote about uh, advantage, uh, uh, comparative advantages and absolute advantages, we, uh, I think it makes rather clear that uh, international trade and globalization uh, has um, uh, made an, uh, a huge contribution to the thrift of the uh, global economy and to narrow the um, economic gaps. So uh, I think that we have to put this event into this kind of context. Yeah, so uh, on globalization in a, in a, in the latest uh, OECD, one of the OECD events, it spoke about globalization and how it raised, I think, a billion people above the poverty line globally. But yeah. uh, my, my background is from uh, energy, some of it. So... Uh, what, uh, it seems to me that in, in the econo eco in the energy markets, the Cold War is becoming a uh, hot war, uh, and as we all know, the OECD, uh, the sorry, the Middle East is one of the main producing areas of the world for fossil fuels, and it's already in all the um, global economic outlooks is a major risk factor. So, um, if I take that as a background. If you can share with me, what is the economic basis of the Abraham Accords and what were the economic benefits that followed the Accords? Yeah, I think that, uh, as you mentioned, the energy war is the hottest part of the Cold War, too. Um, and we have been witnessing that uh, point very clearly in the Ukrainian war. I think it was an excellent uh, laboratory field in terms of energy world, we know that approximately 40% of Europe gas imports came from Russia. Uh, Ukraine has served as a key transit route for Russia uh, to reach uh, Europe. Uh, we have been witnessing as well this disruptions or fluctuations in gas, in, in gas supply from Russia can have significant economic impact on European countries, uh, affecting, of course, industries, households, and uh, overall economic stability. And there have been instances where Russia has been accused of using its gas supplies as a political tool. Uh, for example, uh, disputes between Russia and Ukraine over gas uh, prices that have led to temporary disruptions in, in gas supplies. So now uh, we are trying or we are talking all the time about diversification efforts, okay? And then European countries have been working to diversify other energy sources, uh, Nord Stream pipelines, increasing LNG li imports and liquefied natural gas. Uh, and of course, um, fossil fuels uh, is also a part uh, of this energy war where Iranians and Houthis that were mentioned before uh, has an extreme importance and power because, Ira uh, as we all know, Iran uh, holds the world's fourth largest uh, proven oil reserves in the world, and the Houthis movement is situated near K maritime routes, um, including the Babel Mandate Strait and uh, 
And 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 uh, and the other one I just Or, forget. Hormos, hormos trade. Hormos trade. Yeah, this, thank you. And this location is crucial for gold shipping, particularly to Europe through the Suez Canal. Um, so on one side we have Iran, that is a oil provider and exporter. On the other side we have an Iran proxy that is the Houthis uh, that, that that have an, imme an immense uh, influence. On the transportation of this oil, so um, the the I, I I believe that the answer that the Western is trying to provide it's what what it's named the green transition. Okay, uh, that I absolutely I support, but we have to take into account that this green transition will be hugely costly. So I mean, it's not going to be cheap. Or free, um, and on the this is the one main negative factor. The other one is that you will create more dependence on China. Uh, as someone, I don't know uh, who who said that, but someone very clever said uh, that uh, before you turn green, you have to turn red because. Um, China is having an extremely, uh, it, it's much more advanced in uh, in, it control, in it controls many of the uh, critical minerals for the for this definitely, industry, certainly definitely. Uh, and as uh, as you may know, when geopolitical tensions are and geoeconomic tensions are getting into a pinnacle, minerals, metals, commodities, uh, the 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 Uh, the actor who has who control them has the power, and uh, I think uh, the picture is much more complex that we that we that it's presented right now. Uh, and we if have I to just say may, this. Yeah, sorry, Adrian, if, I may, if I may add to this, from my prior experience, I was the, the uh, in charge of energy uh, SOEs in Israel. So what we saw after the Abraham Accord immediately when it was signed with the UAE is a multi-billion oil deal to export oil from the UAE through Israeli pipelines to the West, to Europe. Yeah, and, 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 and Ariel, just let's have a quick look about what happened last time when Israel signed a normalization agreement. And we are talking about the Abraham Accords. So the Rand Foundation, um, That it's a very uh, prestigious think tank uh, wrote that the Abraham Accords, when fully realized, could create as many as four million new jobs and one trillion in new economic activity only in its first decade. Okay, I just checked a couple of days ago uh, the volume of trading goods, imports, and exports, just in goods, excluding diamonds, between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Um, uh, from the assignment of the agreement and has already reached a cumulative amount of approximately $4.7 billion, dollars, okay, in less than three years. And this is a tiny part because we are talking about trade in goods, not including diamonds. And we know that we have also Israelis uh, basically a service exporter and not a good exporter. On the other side, we have also infrastructure, we have tourism. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, and the, Saudi, uh, the Saudi economy is double that of the United Arab Emirates in terms of GDP. Its population is 3.5 times larger. Its area is 21 times larger and its oil production is almost three times. So I assume that who uh, uh, launched this attack Uh, has a clearly geoeconomic objective as well to avoid this agreement normalization, and it's rather clear and it's well done, uh, and it's data based why they want to stop that because this agreement, the Saudi Arabia one, taking into account the historical experience of Abraham Accords and um, and, and and previous uh, peace agreements will have a tremendous, tremendous influence, not only in geopolitical, 
uh, in the geopolitical picture, but also in the geoeconomic picture? Uh, well, in that regard, there was a very interesting development last uh, September at the G20 summit in India, with, where they declared a new ambitious project, which is called the India, I think it was the India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor, IMEC in short. IMEC. Uh, and uh, it was announced that like a multi billion uh, project of infrastructure for, for rail connections, for pipelines, for uh, natural gas, for hydrogen, uh, um, et cetera, that will bypass all the mari maritime routes that are. Uh, threatened by Iranian proxies that should move from Iran through the Abraham Accord countries, meaning UAE, Saudi Arabia, hopefully, Jordan, Israel, and then to Europe. So what could be the potential importance of such a project? Look, as you, as you mentioned, uh, they were talking mid-September to launch a new trade route. Uh, connecting India, Middle East, Europe through railways and ports, infrastructure, posing a direct and um, uh, uh, of course uh, good as well, goods as well. Uh, but you know, this project was posing a huge challenge to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Okay, talking about Cold War II, geoeconomics, it's rather clear what was uh, their uh, objective and uh, why this IMEC project was aimed to. So, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, by the way, the, it's, it was not just about infrastructure or goods and services, but also um, uh, this route will also enable electricity and digital connectivity. Uh, as well as pipes of clean hydrogen experts. But you know, two days after uh, the brutal attack, the Economic Times, one of the most important Indian news, uh, newspaper, published an article claiming that the, I, the IMEC was a landmark uh, moment for India, promising to make it a bigger player in global trade. But now they wrote, and I quote, the Gaza war casts a shadow over this ambitious project and has dumped the spirits. And two weeks afterwards, the Voice of America headline claimed that the ongoing violence between Israel and Hamas has underlined the, chal the challenges facing an ambitious initiative to build a new trade route from India through the Middle East to Europe. Uh, according to several analysts, uh, analy analysts that were quote, while one of them uh, said that in the midst of this conflict, the whole idea of IMEC is getting lost. So I, am, I, I agree with you that uh, this uh, brutal attack of Hamas uh, support by Iran was, uh, uh, and as Nadav mentioned, maybe with some intervention uh, of China or some support or indirect support, and also from Russia, um, is putting I could elaborate a bit. Sorry, Adrian. Sorry for uh, disturbing you. But you said Russia. What do you think could be the Russian-Iranian axis interest in blocking this uh, IMEC project? Because if we are talking about a Cold War II and a geopolitical fragmentation, uh, they do not want that the, this Western uh, route uh, will. Um, uh, will um, consolidate at the end of the date. And you know something, it's, it's really interesting. One of the main uh, interesting issues that we were witnessing uh, from the, uh, after the 7th October brutal attack was the attitude of Turkey. And I, uh, that was supporting Hamas and embracing Hamas, and I think that's um, an attitude that it also promotes about geoeconomic interests, because Turkey uh, uh, will be real harm with this IMEX project, because the IMEX project is uh, aimed to um, ter, uh, to take um, Turkey off all this huge project and basically not including them in all this good package 
this that the IMEC project uh, was promised to bring us. So uh, I think that uh, this IMEC project is an excellent example why uh, this kind of geoeconomic Cold War II uh, it's creating a, a very important toll, an economic one, to the Western, um, and not only for Israel. Okay, so last question. Uh, we talked a lot about the Abraham Accords and the IMEC project. So what could be, in your view, the prospects for an economic peace in the Middle East? Look, um, the picture right now is that we have in the Hezbollah in the north, we have this, uh, Hamas in the south, we have terrorist cells in the West Bank, we have the Iranian uh, support cuties in the in the in the Red Sea. Um, I think that an economic peace in the Middle East it's critical to the continued prosperity of global economy, which has led to the reduction of economic disparities. And those efforts must include efforts to eliminate terrorist groups in the Middle East, and this must also include efforts. To block fund, uh, funding uh, channels of terrorist organizations as well, and as uh, the previous policy mentions before, uh, I think that if uh, the international community, especially the West, um, they must understand soon and fast that we will all pay the, pay the price. I mean, maybe Israel will pay a higher price, but the, we all will pay the price, um, and they must start to think that these kind of organizations, terror, uh, terrorist organizations, and, um, and this kind of brutal attacks uh, are not just Israel problems, but the whole uh, Western community problems and as Nadav mentioned, if we will not stop them, uh, we will look like a little bit like Tehran and Russia. And that's uh, namely uh, not rule of law, not democratic, uh, and uh, without human rights. And if we back to basics again, and we read what is the main objective of the OECD is, exa is exactly this, it to bolster and promote democratic values, rule of law, and human rights. So I think one of the main things that must happen soon and fast is trying, uh, is that the Western, the Western, uh, uh, the Western bloc, let's put it this way, will start to understand that this kind of attacks and, uh, and this kind of uh, terrorist organizations are jeopardizing not just the Israeli economy, but the whole, of course, the Western economy and the whole world economy. Because uh, as we already mentioned, globalization, democracy has become, uh, has uh, fostered uh, economic prosperity and thrive economy, uh, the global economy to, to the whole world. So I think this is a very important point uh, and we have to take into account these points um, uh, when we see or take into account the trends, the main trends of global economy and especially Western economy. And that is that population is aging, growth is slowing, global trade is decelerating, inflation is persistent and sticky, rates are high for longer. Financial conditions are tightening, debt is soaring, fiscal space is narrowing, and uh, decarbonization is delaying. So when we take the whole macroeconomic global picture, we and it's rather clear that we must understand that this uh, Middle East problem is not just a problem of the Middle East but of the whole uh, Western uh, bloc and the, uh, the whole world. Thank you very much, Adrian. And uh, at this point, I would like to thank all our panelists, uh, Nadav Eyal, Natasha Hausdorff, 
and Adrian Filut for joining us today and sharing with, with us their knowledge. And I would also like, uh, want to ask uh, to thank you, our listeners, our reviewers, for uh, uh, sharing uh, your time with us today. And uh, hopefully it gave you a very broad perspective of what's going on uh, around the horrific 7th of October attacks and the ensuing war. Uh, and uh, another word on, and I go back to the abductees, which are always in our heart, and we're thinking about them, and we're hoping and demanding for the immediate release back to their families. And I hope for all of you to have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much.